of the Punch and Judy Man by local writer Arnold Crowther. The story, which is based on the late Mr. Crowther's experiences as an entertainer, has been adapted for radio in ten episodes. Douglas Leach now reads episode one, introducing Mr. Punch. <laughs> four years old. The occasion was a birthday party. I was a guest and he was an entertainer. There and then he became my hero and I one of his greatest fans. But I don't think either of us suspected that he was destined to become my master. In those days, before the First World War, the theatres and music halls were packed with people every night. George Roby, Little Titch, Harry Champion and Ella Shields were at their height. I saw and loved them all, but what really captivated me were the magicians and illusionists who usually took over the second half of the program. Houdini was the one whose name became a household word. He could escape from anything, handcuffs, straitjackets, safes and prison cells, nothing could hold him. Then there was Henry Golding with his 50 tricks in 50 minutes, and David Daffold whose production of real eggs from an empty bowler had to be seen to be believed. All the stage hands fed off omelettes after one of his performances. Ventriloquists were very popular too. The daddy of them all was Arthur Prince, who used to smoke a cigar and drink a glass of beer while his dummy Jim was talking. Others prided themselves on the number of dummies they manipulated. I remember a nigger minstrel show and a law court scene, both with a full cast of dummies. After a visit to the theatre, we always bought baked potatoes and roast chestnuts from the roast potato man. It was lovely to stand next to his mobile oven on a cold night, watching him stick the cooked potatoes onto spikes and pick the chestnuts from the glowing embers. Besides lapping up the stage shows, I went to see all the touring circuses. One of my favourites, was Bronco Bill's Wild West show, with its sharp shooting, whip cracking, and rope spinning. For weeks after visiting the show, I practiced rope spinning with my mother's clothesline. As a Red Indian fan, I was upset that the cowboys always won, and even more disappointed when I passed a caravan and saw a Red Indian removing his makeup. I felt I'd been swindled. Every Saturday afternoon, I went to the pictures. All silent they were then. To us children, the weekly serial was the attraction. Just when the hero or heroine was being pushed over the cliff or tied to the circular saw, the words would appear, to be continued next week. I remember seeing The House of Hates featuring Pearl White. The villain was the hooded terror. In the episode before the last, she held him at gunpoint and made him remove his hood. Just as he was doing this, the famous words appeared. Unfortunately, I was unable to go the next week, so I will never know who the hooded terror was. Despite all these rival attractions, I didn't forget Punch. Though it was some years after that first birthday party before I met him again. I was on my way home from school when I heard a familiar falsetto voice coming from a side street. A crowd was gathered in front of the red and white striped booth and I noticed that all the grown-ups were smiling and most of the children were screaming with laughter. I pushed my way through and was soon intent on every word and action of the show. I was sad when it ended and hoped the showman would start up again. But he came out of the booth carrying his box of wooden actors and was soon wheeling his little theater away. As I walked home, I envied the man who worked the puppets. I could see he wasn't a wealthy man but he was king of his own little world, inhabited by children who loved him and followed him from street to street. To me, there seemed no better occupation in the world. I discovered that Professor Smith, as he called himself, visited the town twice a year, and I don't think I ever missed one of his performances. I knew every word of the script by heart and was certain that 
I could work the show myself, if only given the chance. Today we rarely see a street performer, but in those days there were two or ten. I was a great devotee of the cowboy whipcracker, who let me hold a match against the side of the box, while he lit it with a crack of his whip. I used to follow him from street to street, doing my part of the act, and sometimes receiving sixpence for my pain. Occasionally, I came across a massive negro who used to fasten a length of wire around his waist and snap it by expanding his stomach. The exercise had left a permanent groove in his skin. Then there was the man with the enormous globe on wheels. He claimed to be traveling around the world with this contraption and living in it as well. He used to lecture about his adventures and then go round with a hat. A regular visitor was an escapologist who was tied in a sack and fastened round with many yards of chain. He remained in this condition while his assistant collected money from the crowd. If enough was collected, he would then escape in a matter of minutes. But otherwise, his assistant would untie him and he would refuse to do his act. When there was nothing else to watch, there was always the Salvation Army with their public confession by people who'd been saved. Of all the street showmen, Professor Smith, with his stripy boom, remained my favorite, and I was determined to follow in his footsteps. But when I confessed this ambition to my mother, she nearly exploded. Do you think we're spending all this money on your education for you to become a street performer? She shouted. If I ever catch you hanging around that busker again, I'll give you the biggest good hiding you've ever had. When my father came home, she broke the terrible news to him, but he only burst out laughing. Oh, so you want to be a Punch and Judy man? At your age, I wanted to be a train driver. And later, I thought I'd be a Red Indian chief instead. Oh, but a Punch and Judy man. Oh, we haven't had one of those in the family yet. My mother couldn't forgive him for taking my ambition so lightly and refused to speak to him for a whole week. Unknown to her, I continued to attend the professor's performances. And one day, I waited for him to come out of the booth and plucked up courage to ask him where I could buy a set of puppets. You don't buy them, he said. They have to be specially made for you. Some of mine have been handed down from my grandfather, and my dad made the rest. He held up Mr. Punch for me to admire. This one must be a oh, hundred years old. He's very beautiful, I said, and the remark seemed to please him. Would you like to have a go at working him? Very much indeed, I said. So he showed me how to put my finger and thumb in the arms and my index finger in the hole in the puppet's neck. You'll be all right when you get older and your hand gets bigger, he said. This, coming from a real professional, convinced me that I was a born Punch and Judy man. I told him of my secret ambition and my mother's opposition. Oh, I don't blame her, he said. There's nothing in it these days. It was all right when my grandfather was alive. He didn't have no picture palaces to compete with. And if we get more cars on the road, there won't be no place left for me to put the box. No, Sonny. I wouldn't be a swaddle of me. What's that? I asked. It's what we call a punch and duty man in the business. The swaddle's what we use to make Punch's squeaky voice. Can I see it? Well, it's really very secret. But as you're going into the business one day, I don't think they'd mind me showing you. I wondered who they were. Did he mean the puppets? Or was there a secret society of Punch and Judy men? He put his hand in his waistcoat pocket and took out an old tobacco box. Opening it, he removed the mysterious instrument. It was made of two pieces of silver about an inch long. Between these was a piece of tape. And the whole thing was held together with cotton. He held it out for me to see. It's all wet. I said, of course it is. It won't work unless it's soaked with spit. 
he showed me how he had to place it at the back of his mouth and half speak and half blow through it to produce the shrill voice of Mr. Punch. Want to try it? He said, handing it to me. But I declined, confessing that I'd be afraid of swallowing it. Oh, you're not a real punchman till you've swallowed three. Have you swallowed three? If I had a quid for every one I've swallowed, I'd be able to retire. Does it hurt? Not really. If you ever swallow one, you just eat plenty of suet pudding, and it'll pass right through you. There was just one more thing I wanted to know. Had the professor been to a special university to learn puppetry? He burst out laughing. Me, a university. Oh, oh, oh my visit on here, that. No, sonny, I ain't had no education at all. That's why I have to make me live it with a fun show. Oh, why do you call yourself Professor then? He explained that in the old days, the music halls were regarded as places of evil, and the artists the scum of the earth. The magicians and conjurers tried to lift themselves above the ordinary vulgar performers by calling themselves professors and the punch workers have followed suit. It don't mean a thing nowadays, but as the grandfather and father both called themselves Professor Smith, I like to keep up the family title. By now, it was time for him to start another show, and he let me stay in the box and watch him work the puppets. I was amazed at the speed with which he changed them with one hand, putting each one back on its hook when he finished with it. Afterwards, I helped him put the figures away. We shook hands, and he wished me every success when I started up on my own. As I stood watching the old fellow with his big walrus moustache and battered hat wheel his show away, I longed to be able to tell someone my wonderful secrets that had been revealed to me. But I knew it would be wiser to keep them. That night, I had a terrible nightmare. I dreamed that I'd swallowed a swazzle. I had to tell my mother, and she stuck me with suet pudding, my pet aversion, but with no results. I was sent to hospital where I was surrounded by masked surgeons armed with knives and saws. They cut me open and searched for a squeaker but couldn't find it and just sewed me up again. I had to go through life talking like punch, and everybody laughed at me. I woke up in a cold sweat, and next day, I couldn't shake the dream off. My school teacher thought I was sickening for something and sent me home. My mother gave me a one remedy for all ills, a big dose of castor oil, and sent me to bed. The terror of swallowing the swazzle was so vivid that it drove away my cherished ambition. In a few weeks, Mr. Punch was completely out of my mind. <laughs>